So, uh, hi guys, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Joshua Crickling from Qubit and Space Time Unit, OIST, uh, Okinawa, Japan, in our QASTM uh, Zoominar series talk. This is 76th talk in the series. He's going to speak about Ullman phase, black hole information and holography, and it is based on his three of words, but whatever he pointed in this slide. And thank you, uh, Josh, for uh, giving this talk. And we are welcoming you uh, uh, from QST forum. So you can start. Okay. Well, thanks very much for the, the opportunity to talk. Um, so yeah, like Santan said, I'm going to talk about these three papers, um, which are about the role of Ullman phase in, in quantum gravity, basically. Um, so let me start by recapping something we're all pretty familiar with. Um, we form a black hole by collapsing some matter in. Uh, uh, this isn't a stable object because it, it will lose energy via the hooking process. And so it will slowly decrease in size. And eventually it will be so small that it reaches the Planck scale and at that point higher order quantum gravity effects take over and um, I'll only really in this talk be interested in what happens before that point. So uh, we can plot the entropy of the hooking radiation over time while this is while this is happening. Uh, I'm gonna ignore that. Uh, <laughs> Hawking, Hawking's original calculations um, suggest that this is the curve that we should plot. So um, he, he just predicted a steady increase in the entropy. But uh, Page pointed out that uh, if the uh, entropy of the, if, if the black hole evaporation process is to be unitary, then the entropy of the Hawking radiation actually has to be less than this curve, which is the uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole. And so you can see that at a certain time known as the Page time, um, the, the, the original Hawking curve isn't consistent with unitarity anymore. And this happens well before the black hole reaches the Planck scale. So if we want to get unitarity back, we need to find a, a correction to a Hawking's calculation uh, that happens at about the page time. So that the, the radiation entropy actually follows this, this curve instead. So it, it turns around at the page time. And this is called the page curve. And this is exactly what's happened in the past couple of years. We've, we've found a way to get this page curve uh, using semi-classical gravity. So apparently the correct way to compute the entropy of the Hawking radiation is by using this so-called island formula. So in this formula, there are some objects that appear. So capital R is a is is a, is a it's sort of a fixed region in space which contains the Hawking radiation, and I is another spatial region which is called the island. And we're supposed to compute a set of extrema of a certain functional uh, with respect to choices of the island, and then the entropy is given by the minimum in that set. And the function is the the area of the boundary of the island over 4G plus another term, which is a so-called bulk entropy uh, of the combined region uh, R and union I. And roughly speaking, the bulk entropy is uh, is the entropy of perturbative fluctuations of, of, of fields on top of the fixed background geometry. So it's useful to draw things on a Penrose diagram. So here's one. Uh, we divide, typically, we, we divide in, in these kinds of calculations. So yeah. We know that island formula is a very successful way to uh, get back this unitary page curve. Uh, but is it the only one, uh, do you think, or like there are some other proposal exist in the literature or? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure there are there are other ways, uh, but um, yeah, I personally find the island 
proposal very appealing because it's sort of simple and geometric and you don't need to go any further than a semi-classical sort of viewpoint to to use it of course uh there are there are bound to be other ways to get unitarity back which don't involve something like an island formula those are sort of seem to me that they'll be quite specific to the type of uv completion of your gravity theory um and it, it, indeed they might even just reduce to the island formula in the semi-classical limit so for example in ads cft where we know the cft is unitary we always then because of that fact suspected black hole evolution to be unitary uh, because it came from a unitary theory but we didn't know that this could be expressed in terms of an island formula um, hmm. I, yeah I, yeah. I, I guess it's it, uh, yeah I don't know if I really am qualified to answer that question fully I, perfect no problem I'm just I just have asked Okay. Right. So yeah. Um, so we typically divide in these kinds of calculations. We divide space time into two regions. One we call the gravitational region, and the other one we call the asymptotic region. Um, and they're they're coupled together at a cutoff surface, which is the dash line. And we assume that gravitational effects only play a role in the gravitational region, and this could be an exact assumption so that we genuine there's genuinely different degrees of freedom evolving in one region to the other or it could just be an approximation um, so that we just we just put this cutoff surface wherever it needs to be so that gravity is weak in the asymptotic region um, so matter collapses to form a black hole um, and then the black hole evaporates and we use the island formula at a particular time by choosing a, a time slice R of the asymptotic region. And before the page time, um, it turns out that the minimal island is, is actually empty. So uh, the island formula just tells us that the entropy of, of the radiation is just given by the bulk entropy of the region R. Uh, and that's just the formula that Hawking used, so that will give us the Hawking curve. But after the page time, uh, enough entanglement has been built up between the uh, inside and the outside of the black hole that there's a there's a non-zero minimal island, um, and eventually this this island will grow to span the entire black hole interior, and so the the island formula corrects. The, the Hawking calculation after the page time. So according to uh, detailed calculations in a wide variety of theories, it seems to be that the island formula is enough to give you the page curve. And this, uh, this validity of the page curve implies that it's consistent to assume that the formation and evaporation of black holes is a unitary process. So in principle, all of the information about what fell into the black hole can be recovered by measuring the Hawking radiation. But it's, uh, I guess, it's, it's not really exactly immediately clear what form that information will, will take once it, once it comes out, because it's, well, this whole, this whole formation and evaporation process is going to heavily encrypt the information. It's going to mix it up and scramble it and we need a way to we need a way to decrypt that information so we can actually, in practice, uh, you know, figure out what went into the black hole. Um, so, in the main part of this talk, I'm going to provide a protocol for doing this, and it's based on an object called the Ullman phase, which is a a generalization of Berry phase to mixed states. And I'll show how you can, you can, you can completely reconstruct the phase space of the inside of the black hole by making measurements of the Ullman phase of the Hawking radiation. And if you, 
if you then combine this with knowledge of the classical field equations, um, which you can just you can just simulate on a on a on an ordinary classical computer, for instance, um, then this this it, this you know it, it will suffice to recover all of the classical information about the matter that fell into the black hole in the first place. So the island formula told us that black hole evolution is unitary, uh, but this tells you how you can actually recover the information. And this is, this actually comes from a generalization of a, a previous result of mine in holography. So it, it turns out that by making measurements of the Ullman phase of the state in a boundary subregion in a, in a holographic theory, you can reconstruct the classical phase space of the fields in its corresponding entanglement wedge. So in this picture, the, the, the blue line is the boundary subregion. The red line is the, the Rio Takianagi surface of that subregion. So it's the extremal area surface homologous to, to the boundary subregion. And then there's a, there's a, there's a bulk uh, partial Cauchy surface interpolating between them and its entanglement, the entanglement wedge is the domain of dependence of that, uh, of that partial Cauchy surface. So the whole highlighted region. So by measuring the Ullman phase, you get the, the phase space of the, this, this entanglement wedge. And the, 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 the black hole information recovery protocol I'm going to describe combines the, inf combines the methods that led to that previous holographic result with the insights that led to the Allen formula. So that will be the main part of the talk. Um, but after talking about black hole information, I'm going to take a step back. Um, so one of the key features of gravitational systems is their high degree of entanglement. And I'd, I'd like to understand what role this plays in the Ullman phase, um, whether, it, whether it influences sort of key features of the Ullman phase. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Ullman phases in generic highly entangled systems. So no assumptions about gravity or holography. I'll just assume that there's some large degree of entanglement that scales in a certain way. And in a certain limit, um, the action uh, uh, for a, a formula, so there's a, there's a path integral formula that I'll, that I'll explain how you derive, uh, which gives you the Ullman phase and the action for this path integral sort of appears to evolve an extra dimension. Um, uh, yeah. And this extra dimension is generated by modular flow, which is a, a kind of, uh, it's a kind of flow on, on, on Hilbert space, which is, which can be associated with any, with any density matrix, which is something that happens in ordinary holography as well. So this, this happens despite a lack of assumptions about any pre-existing holographic duality. So somewhat speculatively, I'll propose that this could be the basis of some kind of mechanism for emergent holography. But um, I should note really that, that there are many unexplored aspects of this. So I don't want to concretely claim that this is holography in a precise sense, but it's, you know, it's tempting to conjecture that it could be, and it certainly seems worth exploring further. Okay, um, so here's a brief plan for the talk. So first I'm going to define Ullman phase because, it, I mean, it's quite an obscure, relatively obscure concept, so not many people know how it's defined. Um, then I'll show how to compute it for Hawking radiation um, and how to use that to, to recover the information. And then finally, I'll describe the Ullman phase of a generic highly entangled system and, and explain this stuff about the, uh, the emergent holography. So yeah, I already had one question. If there are any other questions at any other time, 
feel free to continue interrupting. If you guys have any yeah. question, please ask at this point. If not, he will proceed and in between he will, uh, people will ask. Okay. Is there no questions? I'll just, I'll just get going. So uh, first we have to define omen phase. So I said before that omen phase is a generalization of berry phase. So we should first recall what exactly that is. Um, so to, to compute a berry phase, you're, you're first given a, a curve of states psi of t in some Hilbert space. And then you you take the derivative of that curve, you 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 contract it with the the the, the, the conjugate state of psi, and then you, you integrate this this thing along the curve. And this is called the Berry phase of that curve. So uh, well the original definition of Berry phase actually uh, uh, it was it was it was given in terms of a, a, a slowly varying Hamiltonian, uh, and you needed to use an adiabatic approximation. So you 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 had a Hamiltonian with a non-degenerate ground state, and the Berry phase was associated with a, the, the, a curve of, of of Hamiltonians slowly varying. Um, this is a generalization of that definition. So if you substituted in the the ground state of the Hamiltonian to this curve psi of t, you would get the Berry phase from that definition. But this is the much more general and modern uh, uh, way of defining the Berry phase that you, you don't need to talk about Hamiltonians at all. So if this curve of states is closed, then uh, there's, a, there's a type of gauge symmetry here. So we can, we can do a, a phase shift of the of the states that depends on the parameter t, and the Berry phase will be invariant under that phase shift. So this is sort of this is this is pretty much just a this is a u1 gauge transformation, and and and, and this means that we can view the Berry phase as a as a the the integral of a u1 connection around the curve of states, and that connection is called the Berry connection. So it's a one form on Hilbert space. And uh, it, its curvature is called the Berry curvature, and uh, for the usual reasons, it's uh, it's a gauge invariant object. So, is t usually understood as a time parameter, or can it be something else? It, it can be uh, it can be any parameter. Just some, it's just a parameter along some curve. It could be a time parameter. So, you could be considering a curve which is evolving under some Hamiltonian evolution. Um, but really, it's just this is just a general curve. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, so, yeah. So, Berry Berry phase is really important in the classical limit. So, often you you define such limits by um, specifying a space of of states. Uh, labeled by X here, um, which roughly correspond to the classical states of the system. So, in fact, in the in the classical limit, this the space of states uh, is just isomorphic to the classical phase space of the system, and the symplectic form on that phase space is is just given by the Berry curvature. And this really represents quite a precise mathematical sense in which a classical system arises from a classical limit of a quantum system. Um, you use oscillator, and the states the, the states we're interested in are just the, the the coherent states of that harmonic oscillator. These are parameterized by a complex number alpha, um, and these these uh, these these are these are well suited for, uh, to, to you can use these to as 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 states which approximate classical states with 
position Q and momentum P. And the Berry curvature of these states is, is just the ordinary symplectic form of, the, of, 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 a, of, a, of a harmonic oscillator classically, so dq wedge dp. So in this case, the parameter t has been replaced by alpha, is that correct? Uh, so we have, a, we, have a, we have a space of states uh, with coordinate alpha, and we can take a curve in this, this space, and that curve will be parameterized by coordinate alpha we can think of we can think of uh, the curve as being specified as alpha as a function of t so we'd we'd consider some some function alpha of t that would give us a curve in the space of coherent states um and yeah it can be any any curve you like basically and it, okay and the result doesn't depend on the choice apparently um on the choice of parameter t. No, yeah. So Barry phase is a parameterization invariant thing. So if you you can you can basically see that because um, the Barry phase is the integral of this this Barry connection, which it's just you you form it by compute taking an exterior derivative. There's no reference to any parameter or anything. It's just a one form. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, Okay, um, so another relevant example is comes from holography. So in this case, the the space of states we consider are, are labeled by uh, operator insertions in uh, in the boundary theory, uh, dual to certain sources, um, and then uh, uh, when we insert sources in the boundary in a holographic theory, this uh, this amounts to uh, perturbing the, the 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 bulk state, and uh, this this means that each of all of these states are dual to particular bulk states. And then, if we compute the Berry curvature for them, you you can use sort of saddle point path integral calculations to show that the the Berry curvature is the symplectic form for the bulk fields. So. Uh, this sort of motivates my claim that the Berry curvature gives you the symplectic form. These are two relevant examples, uh, but now I want to understand how to how to do this for a gravitational subsystem. So this holography example was for a gravitational system, uh, but what if we only have access to a subsystem? How do we how do we get its how do we get its classical phase space from the quantum theory? The problem with immediately jumping into this is that the the Berry phase is only defined for pure states, but gravitational systems are very highly entangled. So the state of a subsystem is very highly mixed. So you can't just you can't just compute its Berry phase, or you can't compute a, the Berry phase of a curve of mixed states. So so we we need to do something different. Um, so yeah, if we want to formulate a classical limit of a gravitational subsystem uh, without knowing about the rest of the system, we need to generalize Berry phase to mixed states. And this is this is what Ullman phase does for us. So before we had a curve of pure states, now we have a curve of mixed states or so a curve of density matrices. And I'll assume it's closed. Um, and there's a parameter along that curve, but the the Ullman phase is going to be parameter parameterization invariant again. So, um, so first, let's pick um, a large number of of uh, points along this curve, evenly distributed, and that so that this gives us a, a sequence of density matrices rho k. Um, next, we we pick an auxiliary Hilbert space, H prime, and we pick some we pick some pure states in H tensor H prime, which obey these two properties. So first of all, if you if you reduce psi k, so if you if you compute the reduced density matrix of psi k in in H, 
you get back rho k, so the 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 density matrices along the original curve. So this this means that psi k is a purification of rho. But we also want this second condition to be obeyed, which says that the transition amplitude from one state in h tends to h prime to the next state uh, should be maximum. So at this point we have a we have a sequence of purifications of rho k, maximizing transition probabilities, and now we take the limit as uh, as as the number of points along the curve goes to infinity, uh, and we end up with just a a curve of of pure states in this extended Hilbert space. Um, and I should note that although the original curve of density matrices was closed this this curve of purifications doesn't doesn't have to be so now after coming up with this curve of purifications we can finally define what the omen phase actually is and it's so it's it's given by this formula so you first compute the berry phase around the curve and then you include this extra factor as well which which is the yeah it's the transition amplitude from the last state back to the first state Um, and there's an equivalent way to write this, which will be useful later on, which, which is just in terms of the limit of, a, of the product of the product of transition amplitudes around the, the curve of purifications. And so I should note that there's there's there is some freedom in this choice of the purifications. So you can you can pick a different auxiliary Hilbert space. Um, you can you can pick different purifications within the extended Hilbert space, but so long as the uh, conditions here are obeyed, that the transition probability is maximized, you can show that uh, the the Ullman phase itself doesn't depend on any of these choices. So uh, one final thing to note is that when the density matrices are pure. The, the Ullman phase reduces to the Berry phase. So uh, this really is a generalization of Berry phase to mixed states. Um, so any questions about the Ullman phase? OK, um, so now I've defined it. Um, let me talk about how you compute it for, for hooking radiation. And I don't have time uh, to go into like the, all of the explicit details, but I'll, I'll try instead to just give you an overall flavor of how this argument works. So as I mentioned previously in the introduction to the talk, I'll, in, in, in the setup we consider we've We've split space-time into gravitational and asymptotic regions. Um, and I'll assume that the total Hilbert space factorizes into respective Hilbert spaces for each of these regions. Um, technically speaking, this this isn't this isn't really what's going on in 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 a, in a, in a in, in a theory of gravity, you can't just factorize the Hilbert space in this way. There'll be super selection sectors um, and there'll be even other problems going on. But really, the, this is something that is quite commonly done. And behind the scenes, there's there's regularization and 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 various things going on that allow us to to think of things in this way. Well, I'll just assume that this is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, so then, states in our in our theory, um, which I'll label lambda, essentially amount to the specification of some boundary conditions on a space-like surface. And the 
can compute the inner product of two states in terms of partition functions using this formula. Um, so the, the, denom the denominator is here because I'm going to assume that these states are normalized. So the denominator just means that these are that this product is normalized in the this, this uh, equation. This formula is is normalized in the right way. And at this stage, I'm going to restrict to Euclidean partition functions, uh, just because it makes everything easier to talk about. But at the end of the at the end of the whole thing, I'm going to wick rotate to Lorentzian space time. And um, so how do we compute this partition function? The, the way we do it in a, in a semi-classical effective theory of gravity uh, is, is using this, uh, this, this saddle point formula. So um, minus log of z, which is uh, the effective action of this partition function uh, is given by a sum of two terms. The first is the the, the gravity action, and the second is the effective action of the the, the, the quantum field on the gravitational background. So uh, M here is 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 a is a manifold with metric G, and this this manifold and all of the the quantum fields uh, have to obey the the boundary conditions, which are provided by the, the states for which we're computing the inner product. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a surface in the Euclidean past on which the boundary conditions are given by lambda 1. And there's a surface in the Euclidean future for which the boundary conditions are given by the, the complex conjugate and time reversal of lambda 2, which is what, these, which is what this star and t are supposed to denote. Um, so, so we have we have this complete boundary, and we're, we're supposed to compute this partition function on the on the on the manifold and, and metric, which fill in these boundary conditions, uh, and which minimize the the partition function, uh, which minimize minus log of the partition function. I should say. Um, so to get the, the density matrix for the state in the asymptotic region, or in the asymptotic region as well, contain all the radiation, uh, we just take the trace over the gravitational part of the Hilbert space. Um, so when we, sorry if you can hear that, when we computed the inner product, um, we sum over degrees of freedom everywhere in space. Um, so this is sometimes overflowing. So we sum over degrees of freedom in both the gravitational and asymptotic regions. But on the other hand, to get the, the density matrix, uh, we just sum density matrix as, as describing the state of the Hawking radiation. So when we talk about the entropy of the Hawking radiation, what we really mean is the, the entropy of this state. At the state of the Hawking radiation, we can compute other things. We can compute uh, correlators of, of, of many states. So if, if we take all these density matrices and, and compose them with each other, uh, what this essentially amounts to is, uh, is gluing the uh, the asymptotic region from one one state to the asymptotic region of the other, um, and 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 so on all along the, the chain of operators. And then if we take the, the and we compute again. So, a whole set of boundary conditions all, all joined up together cyclically. So this gives us a uh, uh, with those boundary conditions. So this 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 partition function, uh, to be explicit, is um, 
it can be written in the semi-classical limit in a similar way to before, but so now this, this manifold MN and the metric and the fields all obey these, these, these different boundary conditions. Um, so here's an example for N equals three. We have uh, three different states. There's a past and a future for each state. Um, uh, within each state, the, the, we've done a trace over the gravitational region so that we've glued together the gravitational region within each state, but we've also glued together the, the, the asymptotic regions of the successive states to each other. And then we, uh, we come up with some manifold and metric that fills in these boundary conditions and we compute the partition function on this background. Um, so really the key insight that led to the island formula is that, okay, this is one contribution, but really there's, there's all kinds of different topologies that, that can contribute here. Uh, so because we have gravitational regions and a gravitational theory includes topology changing processes, we should allow all possible topologies that connect the different gravitational regions. So for example, we could have a configuration that looks something like this. Um, there's a, now a wormhole that connects the, the, first, the first copy of the, of the system to the third copy of the system. And what is not So let me give an indication of how exactly this leads to the island formula. So you can compute the entropy of, 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 a, of a density matrix rho using the, the well-known replicate trick. So instead of, instead of explicitly involving log of rho, uh, and then and, and, this formula holds, it gives you back the von Neumann entropy. And in terms of partition functions using the wrote down earlier, you can just you can write this in this way on the right. And because uh, we're doing rho to the power of n, the sources for, for each of the n copies of the states are now uh, exactly the same. So Assuming symmetry is spontaneously broken, which is a common assumption, but it doesn't always hold, but I'll assume in this talk that it does. That means that as well as being obeyed at the boundary, it's going to be obeyed inside of the, the bulk of the gravity, uh, inside the bulk of the, of, of the system as well, everywhere else. So this, the symmetry uh, helps us a lot. So the, the general form of the configuration that, that's going to contribute to the partition function uh, will look a bit like this. So we have these, these, these end copies of the, of the boundary. There's this cyclic Zn symmetry that rotates the whole thing around a little bit. Uh, and assuming this symmetry holds everywhere as well, gives us and epsilon itself is the boundary of a region I. Actually, it's the boundary of n regions I, which are all which are cyclically commuted with each other by the by the replicate symmetry. And this I turns out to be the island. So now we have this, this big configuration involving n copies of the system and there's a Zn symmetry, but we want to get back to a situation where there's just one copy of the system. So we can, we can, we can use the Zn symmetry, divide by that symmetry, and we get back just one copy of the system. Um, and doing that, so you can imagine just taking one of these, cutting and taking one, and I've, I've, I've squished things down a bit into, the, into a flat, Islands. 
Um, but uh, and this almost looks exactly the same as what we had in the uh, in the partition function for just a single partition system. But there are some, some important differences. So the the first important difference is that there's an there's now a conical defect at the boundary of this region I because in this in this n replicated version we had uh, the the total angle going around i uh, epsilon being two pi so when we divide by n it has to now be uh, two pi over n so we have a conical defect and also uh, uh, when we when we take we Breakers, we connect up the various copies of, of, of the original system correctly. These are called twist operators. And these don't just go away when you do the, the ZN quotient. Um, so we need to take into account their contribution. And, and, and they have contributions on the island and the region R. So uh, at this point, we can just use the formula for the entropy, the, the, the replica trick formula. And what one finds is that the conical defect contributes an area term, and the twist operators contribute the uh, bulk entropy term. Um, and there's also an additional thing we have to do, which is because we're computers in a semi classical effective field theory limit, we need to do a minimization and an extremization or an extremization uh, that comes from the saddle point approximation. Um, so what this amounts to is an extremization over the island. Um, and so what we end up with is the island formula. So I've skipped over the details, but this is the, the, the main point of the derivation. So um, we have this nice uh, semi-classical derivation of the island formula, and the key the key point was the inclusion of this replica wormhole uh, topology. Um, so now I'm going to show how, if we include that uh, in another replica trick, uh, we can get uh, a formula for the Omen phase, um, which which will be useful. So one key result. Uh, we'll need is this theorem, which is also due to Ullman. And this says if we have two purifications, psi and psi prime, of two mixed states, rho and rho prime, then the transition amplitude between those purifications will be maximized if and only if this equation holds. So uh, Remember that this maximization is the key to the definition of the open phase. So this is why this is useful. And the quantity on the right hand side is known as the fidelity of these two states, rho and rho prime. And I'm going to show how to compute it for, for states of Hawking radiation. And then uh, I'll show how you use that to find purifications of psi and psi prime such that the, the theorem is satisfied. So to compute the fidelity, we can use a, another replica trick. So we take, we, we take uh, the, the, the inside of the trace, we take it to the 2 kth power, and then we use the cyclic property of the, of the trace. And this means that we can write this whole thing as the trace of rho, rho prime to the power of k. And then to get back the fidelity, we just analytically continue to k equals half. The reason this is useful is the same as the reason the replica trick is useful for computing the entropy. Um, and in that case, it was difficult to talk about the logarithm of rho explicitly. And similarly here, it's difficult to talk about this, this strange combination of square roots of operators explicitly. So instead, we just do this replica trick and we only have to talk about uh, the composition of, of, of density matrices. 
so in terms of partition functions, this this quantity is is given by the the the, the formulas I, I gave before. So. In this, there should be sorry in the denominator here. This should be z one lambda prime to the power of k. So now there are two k copies of the original system. Um, and if if lambda were equal to lambda prime, then um, we would have the same replica symmetry that we had before because all of the sources in all of the copies were exactly the same. So we could do this this cyclic permutation. But when lambda is not equal to lambda prime, um, that full replica symmetry is broken. And it's broken down to a ZK, a ZK subgroup. And, and, and that's generated by just doing the replica symmetry twice. So we, we, we shift once, and when we shift twice, uh, and, and then all of the sources are the same as they were originally. So we have uh, this this leftover symmetry. Um, so whereas before we did this quotient by by the full replica symmetry, uh, we can't do that in this case because that isn't a symmetry anymore. And, and instead, we have to do a quotient by the the leftover subgroup, the zk. Um, so when we take these 2k copies of the system and we divide by k, we're going to be left over with two copies of the system. And the, 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 the leftover space time will look something like this. So we see there, there's two copies of the boundary. So uh, two copies of the Euclidean past and two copies of the Euclidean future. On one copy of the system, we have the boundary conditions given by lambda. On the other copy of the of the of the boundary, we have the, the the boundary conditions given by lambda prime, and then there's a a a, a bulk that fills in this these boundary conditions uh, with asymptotic regions and gravitational regions, and in general there'll be a wormhole that connects the two gravitational regions, uh, and as before uh, the the zk symmetry in the in the full space time without doing this quotient will have a, a fixed co-dimension two surface epsilon, and when we do this quotient, we end up with an epsilon in our quotiented manifold, which has a, a which is a conical defect. This time of opening angle pi over k. Um, so. We have two copies of the system, but we really want to get one copy of the system. So how do we do this? Uh, well, if you notice, there's a there's actually an additional symmetry on this on this manifold, uh, which, we, which will reflect all of the fields and complex conjugate them in in this way. So this lambda prime gets sent to this lambda prime, this lambda gets sent to this lambda, and then we we take a complex conjugate. And we want to now do an additional quotient by this symmetry so that we get just one copy left over. So this, uh, this symmetry actually will fix a, a co-dimension one surface, uh, which I'll label n plus union n minus. And the co-dimension one surface passes through epsilon. Um, so the reason I've decomposed this into n plus and n minus will become clearer. But so basically, n plus and is is the part of of this surface which is closest to lambda prime, and n minus is the part closest to lambda. So let's now imagine cutting along this co-dimension one surface. We'll end up with with two parts, and if you can imagine flattening flattening those parts out. Uh, you get something like this. So you cut along this and then flatten the rain, remaining two pieces, and we get it. Um, and actually, the contributions to the partition function from these two pieces are complex conjugate to each other. So we only really need to focus on one of them. 
and, and that's that's the, the that's basically the Z two quotient that I was talking about. We we throw away one of these pieces. Or we don't yeah. We don't need to think about computing the contribution for one of these pieces because it's just the complex conjugate of the other piece. So let's take the rightmost one. Um, so I've just taken the rightmost one and I've drawn it slightly differently. So I've, I've just moved n plus and n minus closer to each other. And at this point, we have what we wanted. We have a, a single copy of the system. Um, and we can, we can analyze things in terms of the single copy. And as before, in the case of the entropy calculation, uh, there are some extra, extra properties that go into the computation of the partition function on this manifold. So uh, an important one is uh, that the, the fields on the space-time are, are discontinuous when you go from n minus to n plus. Um, and that's because uh, these came from doing a, a path integral on this on this manifold, which everything was continuous on that manifold. Or, uh, but now there's no reason why the fields on n plus should be the same as the fields on n minus. So we can think of this as a, a discontinuity on this space time. And this this itself can be thought of as being implemented by the insertion of some operator on a surface in between n plus and n minus. So this operator implements the, the, the change in the fields as you go from n minus to n plus. Um, and the symmetries I talked about before are actually enough to uh, deduce that this operator has to be unitary. Uh, so other, uh, apart from this extra feature, the, the, there's, a, there's a conical defect on the boundary of I, um, and we have the, the twist operators as before. But otherwise, this is, just, this is just the same as a single copy of the system with the right boundary conditions. So if we do a bit more work with this, um, we can analytically continue to k equals half, and we'll find that this equation holds. So the thing on the right-hand side, that's the fidelity, which is what we get from continuing this setup to k equals half. And there's a unitary operator inserted here, uh, which appears now on the left-hand side in between lambda prime and lambda. So lambda prime in the future and lambda in the past. So this is exactly, uh, well, so I should say first that you can see that you, this operator u lambda lambda prime only acts in the gravitational region. So uh, that means that these two states, which I've defined here, psi, which is just lambda, and psi prime, which is u dagger acting on lambda prime, these are purifications of, of the original density matrices rho and rho prime. So at this point, we can just use Ullman's theorem. So we've constructed these two purifications. We know that they obey this, this equation, that the absolute value of the transition amplitude is equal to the fidelity. So we can therefore deduce that they maximize the transition probability. Um, so now we can actually use this result to compute the Ullman phase. So we pick... Uh, we, we, have a, we have a curve of, of boundary conditions, which gives us a curve of states. We pick density matrices ordered along this curve of states. Uh, then using the, 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 sort of the, the, the path integral methods I just described, we get these unitary operators, um, which we've inserted on the surface N. And, and Using these unitary operators, we get a sequence of purifications of the densities, which uh, maximize the transition probability by Ullman's theorem. Uh, yeah, so they're appropriate for the, the calculation of the Ullman phase. 
So substituting everything into the, the definition of the element phase, we get this expression. And at this point, it's actually uh, relatively simple to compute each of the terms in front of uh, using the actions of uh, unshell field configurations. And by that, I mean, we take this space time with this functionality and uh, the appropriate uh, behavior at the boundary of the island and the twin operator. We take a classical limit so that only one field configuration dominates. Um, and then we can write the, the, these things in terms of the action of that field configuration. Um, uh, so I'll skip a few details here. But, um, there's a formalism known as the covariant phase space formalism, which is a, a very convenient way of expressing the, the symplectic form of a, of a field theory in terms of, uh, in terms of the on-shell action. Um, and we can use that formalism to write the, uh, the Ullman phase in this way. So we go from this expression to this expression. Uh, again, I'm skipping some details, but the details are skipping are kind of the boring part. So I've introduced some notation here. Phi of J is the the dominant field configuration for the the state lambda of J. So it's the one that, that dominates the the classical path integral for the boundary conditions given by lambda of J. Delta of phi is the the change in in field configuration. as m goes to infinity and uh, that is sum converts to an integral this one over m piece goes away so we just find that the Ullman phase itself is given by the around the curve of field configurations corresponding to the curve of states um, so if you didn't follow all of the details of that relation, um, I don't blame you. I stumbled a bit, but this is the, the key result you should keep in mind. The, the Ullman phase of the Hawking radiation is equivalent to the integral of the symplectic potential of the, of the island and the radiative region around the curve of the configurations. So there's a direct connection between the Hogan radiation and the classical phase space of the island. Uh, so let me now assume that each configuration eventually collapses to form a black hole. And simplicity, I'll just assume that uh, once that collapse has happened, all of the classical fields outside of the back hole are the same for every uh, initial configuration. So that means they have no idea what went into the black hole. So now instead, uh, or in addition, let's let Q be another space. It's the space of possible states of the Hawking radiation uh, rho uh, after the page time. So a less less naive observer is able to measure the Ullman phases of paths in this, in this space. So they, they can they can have they can they could, they could have set up a, a curve of initial states because. Which is what they have access to. Um, the integral of the symplectic uh, potential. Um, actually, if you if you know the integral of the symplectic potential around any curve in a space, uh, that's the same as knowing the uh, the symplectic form everywhere in that space. 
because you can consider the symplectic potential, the integral of the symplectic potential around arbitrarily small curves, and, and there's a relationship uh, between that and the symplectic. And that's pretty much what it, what it means to be able to, uh, to carry out uh, uh, an experiment. Uh, so uh, the way we can, the way we carry out uh, experiments is we we take some apparatus, we call it weekly to the thing we want to measure. Uh, we let the system evolve, and then we um, compute a change in phase. Uh, and in the classical limit, this this really is just a computation of a Poisson bracket. So if we can if we have access to the symplectic form, that means we we can compute arbitrary classical arbitrary Poisson brackets, which means we can from the right. That means the island will eventually span the entire black hole interior. So this means that they can they can carry out arbitrary classical measurements everywhere inside the black hole that they like. Um, or, or, so I should include a caveat here that the island never reaches the singularity, so they can't measure things near the singularity, but they can they can measure things on a on a on a Cauchy surface for the entire the entirety of the of the black hole interior. So then they can they can take this classical state of the matter inside the black hole um, and run the classical equations of motion on that matter backwards in time, maybe on a classical computer, and this allows them to deduce the initial matter configuration. And so in this way, it's really this really means that rho is highly mixed in the classical limit because as we go as we take h bar going to zero, the uh, the modular Hamiltonian grows. Um, and because of that, uh, uh, because of this scaling, uh, k going like one over h bar, uh, this map modular flow, uh, one can show it, it reduces to a classical flow one, one request. in the phase space. My internet connection yes. was suddenly dropped. So uh, last of your five slides, I couldn't able to hear. Could you please repeat, if you don't mind? 41. Uh, sure. 41. Okay. So did, did you get to, did we get to the end of this previous slide? One. Yeah, previous one. Yeah. From here, it was lost completely. So please repeat if you don't mind. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, um, right. So we, we, we have this setup where you can, uh, carry out arbitrary classical experiments in the island. And if the observer waits long enough, the island will span the entire black hole interior so they can carry out arbitrary classical experiments on a, on a Cauchy surface for the inside of the black hole, which means that they can deduce the classical state of the matter inside the black hole. And then if they run the classical equations of motion backwards on that classical state, they can get the initial matter configuration. So they, in that way, they just get, they recover all of the classical information about the initial state from the state of the final Hawking radiation. Uh, really to the, the Ullman phase of a generic highly entangled system, which we'll, uh, we'll see it appears to have some holographic features. So we take a generic system with a Hilbert space H, uh, and assume that this system has a classical limit in terms of coherent states, which means there's a, a classical phase space. There's the and there's a resolution of the identity in terms of those states, and also the Barry curvature of those states is proportional to the symplectic form, 
where the, the, the constant of proportionality is, is h bar. On that phase space, so that theta is the sum of the i of pi dqi. Uh, so we want to compute the Ullman phase of a closed curve of density matrices. And there's this formula that Ullman, the Ullman phase is just the expectation value in the in the, the initial density matrix of a certain path ordered exponential. So the path ordered exponential is of this operator A, which is defined so that it obeys this differential formula. Where we assume it is, has this integral solution, which can be confirmed just by direct substitution. Um, so if we insert this partial many times, uh, we'll end up with a path integral, uh, just very similar to the usual derivation of a path of a path integral. And the path integral we get can be written in this way. So we have an integral over paths in the, in the phase space, uh, weighted by e to the i s over h bar, where the action s is given by this equation. And there's also an additional term uh, here, which comes from the fact that we're doing a, uh, an expectation value in row naught. So we want to know what happens to this action in the classical limit. Well, the first term is just the is just the Berry connection uh, along the curve, and by assumption, the Berry connection will give us the symplectic potential because these are coherent states with a classical limit. Uh, but what about the second term, which is more interesting? So to address that term, it's useful to do some algebra and write A in a different way. So uh, I won't explain exactly how to do this. It's not too hard, but you just substitute some formulas in and you find that you can write A in this way. Um, and the reason this is useful to do is because uh, it involves some concepts we might already know some things about. So K here is the modular Hamiltonian associated with rho. So it's defined as minus log of rho. And um, it's uh, in, uh, yeah, so this is something we know about in, in, in theories of gravity, which I'll say in a second. Um, and this map taking O to rho I alpha, O rho minus I alpha, which appears here acting on K dot, is known as modular flow. It's a one parameter family of maps. And in gravity, the modular Hamiltonian of a subsystem is, is typically given by the error of some surface divided by 4G h bar. So inspired by that, we'll assume that the modular Hamiltonian goes like 1 over h bar. So in the classical limit, the modular Hamiltonian grows. So what this means is that uh, the state is highly mixed in the classical limit. And you can also show that for, for any operator that goes like 1 over h bar, the, uh, it, the, uh, any Hermitian operator that goes like 1 over h bar, the, the unitary flow that it generates uh, reduces to a classical flow in the classical limit. So uh, modular flow here will reduce to a, a classical uh, flow in phase space. Um, so, f so from this condition that k equals order 1 over h bar, you can deduce, deduce that a is also order 1 over h bar. So this means that both terms in the action are, are order 1 in the classical limit. So we need to take them both into account. Um, so now if we substitute this expression for A into the, into the action, what we find is uh, a formula of this, uh, of this form, an expression of this form. Uh, so again, I've left out some details. You just have to do an uh, integration by parts. Um, these states x, t of alpha are defined by the action of modular flow on the, on the states x of t. 
Um, and you can see that this integrand here is proportional to the Berry connection. Um, but it's, it's proportional to the Berry connection along uh, a different curve to the one it was before. It's, it's the original curve of states, but we've acted on that curve by uh, modular flow at each, at each time. And since modular flow reduces to a classical flow in the classical limit, we can label these states xt of alpha by canonical coordinates p i alpha and q i alpha, and then substituting in the uh, the expression for the symplectic potential, which is the very connection in terms of these canonical coordinates, uh, we get this formula for the action. Um, so one thing we can do is we can we can actually just recognize that this action is a Hamiltonian action. So uh, we have a, a, a term which is a syntactic potential. In a general Hamiltonian action, you'd also have a, a Hamiltonian term, but for us, the Hamiltonian vanishes. But the syntactic form of this action is just given by this. And if we if we compare to the original syntactic form in in the phase space. What we can observe is that there appears to be an extra dimension's worth of degrees of freedom. So we, ha we now have this parameter alpha. Uh, and in addition to having the sum of the i, so the sum of the canonical coordinates, we also have a sum of the alpha uh, weighted by such pi alpha. And at each value of alpha, we have additional uh, canonical degrees of freedom. And this extra dimension appears to be generated by modular flow because this is what this parameter alpha does. Um, so this seems to be hinting in, in some sense at a mechanism for some kind of emergent holography. Um, and if we compare what's happening here with known results from holography, there's, we can see that there's some correspondence. So in particular, the, the Ullman phase probes the bulk in the way it appears to here. Uh, and also in both cases, the modular Hamiltonian has have the same scaling. But on the other hand, what I've described to you is, is far from a detailed picture. And, and there are many outstanding questions. Um, perhaps the main one being, why should the holographic bulk only appear in the Ullman phase? Um, if this is really a genuine holographic duality, it should be relevant to uh, other quantities as well, like transition amplitudes and correlation functions. Um, and I don't have time, I, I, well, I don't have all the answers to these questions, and I don't have time to go into detail on the answers I think I might have, but um, I will comment that this probably has something to do with decoherence, because um, the key role played by transition probabilities in Ullman phase, uh, you know, that's that's special to, to, to the Ullman phase. Um, so in, in order for the Ullman phase to be relevant to other quantities, there needs to be some reason for transition probabilities to be relevant to those quantities. And this is exactly what decoherence does. It causes the transition probabilities to play a role in the general dynamics of the system. So let me summarize what I've told you about today. So first I showed how one can derive this formula for the Ullman phase of Hawking radiation in terms of the classical phase space of the island. Then I explained how one can use that formula uh, that it, to recover all of the, the classical information that falls into and finally, I derived a path integral formula, or I gave an outline of how you can derive a path integral formula for the Ullman phase of a generic highly entangled system uh, that appeared to evolve an extra dimension in the classical limit. And I suggested that this could be the, the, the basis, or that it could form the skeleton of a basis of a mechanism for emergent holography. So here are some open questions on these toppings that 
might be interesting to explore. So, uh, so this this uh, this formula for the Allman phase only really told you what happened uh, up to the Planck scale. So, what happens once the black hole reaches the Planck scale? And I guess this is something that it's not fully understood for the island formula more generally. So maybe that's something that we'd have to answer. Uh, next, this was a this was something that really applied in in the classical limit or a semi-classical limit. So this this protocol told you how to get back the classical information, but maybe if you include included some higher order corrections, you'd be able to get back some more uh, uh, quantum information. So you learn sort of about the entanglement of the state. Uh, third is a bit more of an open, uh, even more open question. Why does the Ullman phase appear to play a key role? I mentioned that I have a suspicion there's something going on with decoherence, but I don't know for sure. So it'd be interesting to understand more about that. So what is the precise relationship there? And the final question uh, there comes from uh, the fact that uh, there are some results that say that even though the, uh, the, the, the validity of the page curve means that, or that it's consistent to assume that we can recover information from inside a black hole, um, these results claim that uh, any, any, any algorithm that we carry out on a quantum computer to, to actually sort through the Hawking radiation and find that information has to be very complex. So if those results are true, then that would mean that computing the Ullman phase in the way I've described of the Hawking radiation has to be very difficult. So it'd be useful to, to know what is the complexity of the Ullman phase, how, how complex would an algorithm have to be to actually compute it. So uh, how difficult would it actually be, used, be to use this protocol to recover the information. Uh, other than that, thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to to, to uh, if any questions or discuss. If, uh, guys ask, and I'm also very sorry about the internet connection. I, that's fine. Broke and uh, yeah, sorry for that. But if any uh, before asking question, please unmute yourself and give a clap for Josh for giving such an outstanding talk and uh, giving uh, some insight about Ullman phase. So, uh, and- uh, Thank you. Please uh, ask question if you have particularly, or you can also write to him if you want. And uh, this talk will be posted in YouTube, though I have to actually <laughs> join the two parts of your talk because uh, one part is be before cutting the internet, oh, yeah. and another one is the later one, and I have to join it very carefully. And uh, yeah, but hopefully I can able to manage it. Oh, yeah. it happened to me many times, so that's not a problem. Oh, right. Okay. And I will share the link with you. And uh, if anybody have any question, please ask. Otherwise. Uh, uh, you can write to him later and uh, thanks josh for giving mm. this talk and uh, yeah like maybe students Th can ask you question later if they are not feeling okay to write now asking you and i'm Sh also sure, yeah. uh, hopeful that you have also enjoyed to give the talk and uh, uh, yeah like hello thanks for giving uh, can you able to hear me uh yeah, again, internet problem. Yeah, it, it cut out for a second, yeah. but it's fine now. So I'm saying that, so thanks for uh, your contribution for our forum. And uh, maybe in near future, you will give another talk with some new idea. So. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and the opportunity and everything. So see you. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Nice to meet you.